They were not looking to the future. They were just looking to the past and the present. And we were the future. Hi, everyone. It's Kara Golden from The Kara Golden Show. And I'm so excited to have my next guest here. I mean, I'm really excited to have my next guest here. He also just wrote an incredible book that I just finished. It's called The Shoemaker. I have it here if you can see it, if you're watching on YouTube. But we have Joe Foster with us, who is the founder of Reebok. And we are thrilled to have this legendary creator of an incredible shoe brand with us today. We're going to learn a little bit more about the brand and his journey overall. Uh, Joe comes from a family of shoemakers with his grandfather pioneering the spiked running shoe back in the early 20th century. His grandfather's shoes received worldwide recognition uh, when two UK athletes won the Olympic gold medals while wearing his shoes. With shoemaking in his blood, Joe founded Reebok in 1958 with his late brother, Jeff, and they followed in his grandfather's footsteps. We'll hear a lot more about that. And just last year, as I just mentioned, Joe wrote an incredible book called Shoemaker, the untold story of the British family firm that became a global brand, which documents his incredible story. So we are so excited to have Joe with us here today to talk to us a little bit more about growing the business, creating the business challenges and everything in between. So thank you, Joe, for coming on. Well, Cara, what an introduction. Absolutely fantastic. What can I say? But, uh, <laughs> uh, that's wonderful. You, you, know, you make me sound as though I, uh, I did something good. <laughs> we, we tried, but thank you for the invitation. You absolutely did. So let's talk a little bit about small Joe. So who was Joe as a little kid? Who was Joe as a little kid? Well, he was born in 1935. And of course, four years after I was born, we had World War II. So as a, a young boy, I grew up during the war years. But you know, you, you, when you're a kid, that's what, that's what life is. Yeah. So it didn't make any difference to myself and my older brother, Jeff. We, we sort of just enjoyed it. We had, <clears throat> you know, when you change the clock round for summertime, we had double summertime which meant that it was light all the way through to about 11 p.m. at night. So we, we could be out there playing and enjoying ourselves. Um, yes, we could, see, we could see when the bombs had dropped on Manchester because Bolton, where we lived, was just a bit higher up than Manchester. So we could see the red glow of bombs dropping. So, you know, okay, during, during the war years, we had six years of war, and it was 10 before that was over. But, you know, why am I called Joe? That's the reason. Why am I called Joe? You mentioned my grandfather. He was born in 1880. It's a long time ago that now. <laughs> Mind you, I suppose 1935 is a long time ago now. <laughs> but uh, he, he was born way back there in uh, um, 1880. And by 1885, he was only 15. But he made, as you alluded to, he made the first pair of uh, spike running shoes for athletes. And he wore his spike running shoes in, the, in his next event. And he, he came second when he usually was halfway down the field. So he then had a business. Um, and by 1900, he, he, was, he had his J.D. with Foster Business, making running shoes, track shoes, for all the local athletes, which was great. And you said he, <laughs> and he did. He got uh, athletes to wear his shoes for Olympic gold medals. Uh, during the first decade of the uh, 20th century, <clears throat> he had three world records. A man called Alf Shrub broke three world records. He had gold medals from the London Olympics in 1908. Then we had World War Two. Sorry, World War One. We had World War One. Nobody wanted run issues then, so they turned the business into repairing army boots. So the army boots coming back from Flanders and. My father used to tell his story, which was that he used to scrub all the mud off. And instead of the water being sort of brown, it was red because of all the blood and whatever that uh, of sort of fighting a war there in France. However, by the 1920s, um, grandfather again, this was his belly pot. This was his, his, his decade. 
we, we have a letterhead. And on the letterhead, right at the bottom there, and he actually writes that, that Jay Wu Foster's supplied all the shoes to the 1920 Olympics in Antwerp. Well, I don't know how many, whether just the English team he's talking about, British team. But, uh, I mean, you know, that was pretty good for those days. And, and of course, he picked up a lot of gold medals. But his, uh, I think possibly his biggest claim to fame was, have you heard of the film Chariots of Fire? Absolutely. Yeah. It immortalizes three athletes, Eric Little, um, Harold Abraham, and Lord Burley. They all won gold medals at one, I think one of the events was in Amsterdam, the other one in Paris, the Olympic Games. And, of course, they made a film. But uh, my grandfather had made their shoes. So he had claimed to making the shoes for those people. Unfortunately, my grandfather died in 1933. And I wasn't born until 1935. But I was born on his birthday. That's wild. And my grandmother, she absolutely insisted insisted I become Joe Foster. So I took on my grandfather's name of Joe. Mother didn't like that idea, but mother was a bit frightened of uh, <laughs> of my grandmother. So grandmother went out and I'm called Joe. I love it. So did your dad then take over your grandfather's business? My dad and my uncle, they were brothers. They took over the business. There was five years difference between them. My My father was younger than my uncle. But they didn't get on. They, in fact, not they didn't get on. They had a feud. Whatever the feud was about, we don't know. We don't know even to this day. But uh, they hardly spoke to each other. And in fact, Jeff and myself, when we were at the factory, we had to bring them apart. But they were fighting. You know, and that's not good for business. And wow. uh, it was okay. Well, it was okay when my grandmother was there. But when my grandmother died... That was when the trouble started, and they just didn't speak. I didn't get to the business until I was 17 years old. When I got in the business, I only had one year. When I was 18, we had to do national service. So Jeff and myself, we had to go away. Jeff went to Germany to do national service. He was in the Army. I was in the RAF, and I went on to radar. But Jeff, he, he, was, he, he saw Adidas. He saw Puma. And saw what they were doing. So when we when we came back, and we came back to a failing company, J.W. Foster's, then J.W. Foster and Sons, it was a failing company. It, it had a had a wonderful history and done some marvelous things. But because father and uncle didn't get on, the business was failing. I mean, you know, you can imagine hmm. two people who own the business, fifty percent each, and all you do is fight. The, the loser is the business. What we tried, we tried to persuade my father, look, you've got to change. You have to change. Um, but no, when Bill's gone, that was my uncle. He was John William. We were all JWs, by the way. My father was James William, uncle John William. My grandfather had been Joseph William. I was Joseph William. My brother was Jeffrey William. And I had a younger brother, John William. So, but my father said, look, when... When your Uncle Bill goes and I go, that'll be your business. You can do with it what you want then. I say, look, Dad, look, look this, we don't want you to go. <laughs> That's not the plan. You know, it's not the plan at all. But this business will be gone long before you are. It will be dead. It will go. Uh, it took us uh, a couple of years to prepare ourselves, I suppose, for not taking over the business but leaving the business. And... Uh, Jeff and myself, we we went to college at night to learn more about the business or more about shoemaking because what we knew was how to make running shoes. But, you know, you need to you know a lot more than just how to make running shoes because we needed to know where you're getting materials from, what the new techniques were. We needed to know all that. But in November of 1958, I think we'd had enough. And so we left the business and we set up our own small business called Mercury Sports Footwear. Very, very interesting. So what was the idea behind Reebok? I mean, with you and your brother, you were trying to solve a problem. How did this come about? 
Well, I mean, the problem was that uh, the, the business, J.W. Foster business, was going nowhere. It was going out of business. Neither my father nor uncle were really that interested in taking the business forward. It supplied a living, a very nice living at the time, but that living was going down. We had a future. We were young. Where was our future? That was the problem. Our future was that this business wouldn't be there. So you, you set up a bad business, you become an entrepreneur, you, you do something that, and, you know, and what can go wrong? Well, we didn't think anything could go wrong. And so we, we decided that the best thing we could do if we wanted to uh, um, develop a business was to actually leave the, the Foster's business and set up on our own. So that was it on this November, uh, November day, it was a Friday. Uh, when I told my father we were leaving, that we're going to set up our own business. He wasn't very happy. In fact, he, he, he got up out of his chair in the office and he picked up a, a letter opener and he walked towards me. But he gave it to me and said, stab me now. And all I could say, look, we, you know, we tried, tried to get you to come with us to build a business for the future and you wouldn't so he wasn't going to do it so we had to leave and we set up as i said we set up as a mercury sports footwear and you know what can go wrong well lots of things go wrong lots of things happen because we were, we were only mercury sports footwear for 18 months and after 18 months our accountant our accountant was saying look boys you're doing pretty well you know you're making some money and that's okay you'd better register that name mercury well we were young fairly naive still and said why do we need to do that well they said look a lot of people will see your your product it's nice it's good and if they think it's that good they'll copy it and they can also start making mercury shoes unless you register the name oh so i tried to register the name and i found out that it was already pre-registered. Another company, a shoe company, um, part of British Shoe Corporation, big company, they had the name. And we found out that, uh, yeah, they would sell it to us for a £1,000. Well, in those days, we talk about 1960, um, we'd just set up our factory for £250, which, you know, in, in today's money is about $300. We'd set a whole factory up for that. So a thousand pounds was just out of sight. We didn't have that sort of money. So I was told to go and see a patent agent who would help us to um, get a new name. And the patent agent said, well, okay, but you need to bring me 10 or 12 names. And I'm saying, well, just a minute, you know, this is our company. We've got to believe in it. He said, well, to get your name registered, you need enough, and we need to test those through the registrar. And he pointed through the window. He said, a name like that, and that was Kodak. And I said, well, what's with Kodak? He said, well, that's their own name. They made it up. They invented the name. So nobody else can have that. It's not, not a name you can find anywhere. Oh, okay. So we go back, and we're sitting around the table, and we're trying to think of names. And we're thinking, Cougar. Ah, Cougar Sports, that would be good. Cougar, yeah, it's a nice name. Uh, Falcon. Falcon Sports, yeah. Put those on the list. But let me take you back to 1943. I'm eight years old. And uh, just like COVID, nobody could nobody could move. Oh, it's the middle of the war. The war is on, so we're not going anywhere. You know, holidays at the seaside, no, those things didn't happen then. So uh I am entered into a running race, 60 yards, a 60-yard race, and I win the race. Oh, great. I had Foster Spikes on, and the Spike shoes in those days, very, very few of my com competitors had Spike shoes on. In fact, I don't think anybody, I think it was only me with Spike shoes on. And I won the race, and I go up to collect my prize. And it's a dictionary. They gave me a dictionary. I'm eight years old, and I'm saying, where's the football? Come on, you know, surely. No, it's a dictionary. I didn't know it at the time. It took me a bit of time to uh, recognize the fact that uh, it was an American dictionary. It was a Webster's American dictionary. 
And the spellings are somewhat different than the Oxford English Dictionary. You know, in America, you don't put a color in C-O-L-O-R. We spell it C-O-L-O-U-R and a few names like that. So I didn't know that at the time, but uh, we're now back in 1960 and I have my dictionary next to me, my American dictionary, and I like the letter R and I start thumbing through and I get to R E E B O K, which is pretty soon, you soon get to that. And I said, R E E B Reebok, what's that? And I read out what it is. It's a small South African gazelle. Gazelle. We're a running company. Gazelle. Fantastic. Top of the list. I love now, it. Yeah. Now, had that been an English dictionary, it would have been R-H-E-B-O-C-K. Now, it would take me a long time to go out to R-H, but, and, and I don't think that would have been as, as attractive either. So thank goodness I had an Amer- American dictionary. What was the thing that you really wanted when you decided that you wanted to create Reebok, what problem were you really solving? Well, the, I think the problem we were solving was how are we going to make a living? Mm-hmm. Okay. And the natural thing is okay. we need a job <laughs> because we know the JJ we foster company is going to go out of business. What were the choices for running shoes? Um, well, I mean, we're talking about athletic footwear, which is more than running shoes. It's uh, soccer boots and uh, rugby. Rugby is a big thing in, in the north of England. Rugby was quite big so we we could we could make specialist shoes and the demand was there fosters had been making those sort of products and they were losing the business they were losing it to people like adidas and quite a few small english footwork companies quite a few small ones were making the product we we thought we could uh, we could make good product we thought you know we need a business we need to be Continue, if you like, the, the, the family tradition. It's in our DNA. So, you know, we, we, were, we were thinking, well, this, this is a job we know. This is something what we know about. So if we, uh, if we set up on our own, we can do the things that J.D. with Foster isn't doing. Now, they were not looking. They were not moving forward. They were not looking to the future. They were just looking to the past and the present. And we were the future. Jeff and I were the future. And so, you know, our problem was the future. <laughs> it's as simple as that. We uh, and if uh, if the parent company wouldn't wouldn't continue um, growing and inventing and developing, just like grandfather had done in his day, he, he was obviously quite a pioneer. And uh, to, you know, to have uh, I mean, some say he invented the spike track. Actually, we got the idea from his grandfather. His grandfather was a cobbler. He used to repair shoes, but he also repaired cricket boots. Yeah, it's been in the business for a long time. I want to get I want to get more into Reebok because I think there's so many interesting pieces here. So as you started Reebok uh, yeah. with your brother, one of the things that I read read is that you went into a distribution deal uh, with Lawrence Sports. Do you remember that deal? I mean, what was kind of the biggest mistake when you think back on that? It turned out to be probably the biggest mistake of my life, definitely, yes. I've probably made many others, but that was a big mistake. Um, but it, it wasn't at the time. At the time, the, the sales manager, the sales director, he he was a good friend because you, you meet people within in the, in the business when you're traveling, you meet these people. And he was a good friend of mine, Derek Shackleton. Um, and I knew that he would do a good job. So I could let them be my distributor while I concentrated on design, changing, looking for new ideas, and probably going to America. But in those days, I, I, I wasn't really I, – I knew I wanted to get the American market, but I, I had no idea how to at that point. So I appointed them as a distributor. And the problem was that uh, – the I should say the the owner of the business, the owner of Lawrence Sports, he was he was in his seventies then, and he retired, and he retired, and he he actually put his son in law in to manage the business. So his son in law came to manage the business, and unfortunately he had no idea. And my friend, who was the sales manager, he just did not get on with the son in law at all. So he left, and when he left. The company had 
You know, if you lose your salesman, you 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 really good. Sal- you lose your salesman, you lose a lot of business, and they lost a lot of business. And the problem is that uh, they lost so much. I the story. It's absolutely incredible how how they did this. They were trying to change. They, they made soccer boots, only soccer boots, and soccer boots. The, you can sell them in about August because the season is just starting. And then you can re, you can have more sales in December, just before the Christmas break and the holiday break. So you can do that. But during the rest of the uh, the year, they're just making boots. They're just making the shoes. And they decided they wanted to upgrade. The son-in-law decided he wanted to go from the method they were using to uh, attach the soles and the studs to the boots. He was going to go with a nice big fancy machine which would inject them. That was okay, the idea was okay. The problem is that the machine was late arriving. They didn't, they they had to build a new building to put the machine in and they built it too small. So by the time they had this machine to make the boots, the season had gone and they were out of business. Just uh, the business just fell apart, and I had I had to dash down to. Uh, they were about sixty miles away from our factory. I had to hire a van and go and pick up all my shoes, which they hadn't sold because they stopped paying me. So I picked them all up. We brought them all back to uh, to uh, Berry, which was next to Bolton, where we uh, and we had to put a plan together. But unfortunately, I, I had to lay off. Half of the staff, because we now we had nobody buying our shoes. Uh, the distributor was about seventy-five percent of our production. I had twenty-five percent with different things that we were doing and uh, own brands. Different. Uh, uh, I was making climbing boots for a store in Manchester. So, so we had about twenty-five percent. But when you lose seventy-five percent of your business. It means I had to lose a lot of uh, employees. How did you ultimately recover from that? Well, as I say, I, I think it's about 2,000 pairs of shoes. We're only a small company. 2,000 pairs I brought back from Lawrence Sports. And we put together a plan to go to all the schools, all the secondary schools within our area. There are probably hundreds of them. And we went there. We we made deals with the uh, the instructors, the coaches, and we, we were selling the shoes at a very heavily discounted price to the coaches. They could sell them to all the children. Um, but that price was better than we were getting from the distributor. So we were, we were making more money. And it took about well, less than three months, and we sold the whole stock, and we got the money in. And we survived. So going direct, you were ultimately able to make more money and recover. And then how did you ultimately get to the U.S. then? That was a, was a different story because uh, I, I, I'd wanted to get to the U.S. I said, look, Foster's had been selling 200 pairs of spike shoes, hands on, to Yale University, to uh, Bob Jane Jack and Frank Ryan. They were they were head coaches there, and they were taking them, and they were selling those to other universities in America. So we they've been supplying Yale, and, and I knew that every well every college, every university had coach, and coach was a god, and you could actually go to university on a sports scholarship. So you know this I knew this market was so big, so vast compared to the British market, which is not a bad market but relatively small. And I was reading a magazine, I think it was called Eurosport, and there's an advertisement in there from our government, from the British government, and they wanted us to export. And they were willing to pay for a, a stand mm-hmm. at the NSGA show in Chicago, uh, to pay our return airfare, and also half of our hotel bill. Well, really, there was no mm-hmm. reason why I shouldn't go. So I didn't. And this is 1968. 1968 was my first attempt to get into America. And uh, it was rather interesting. People loved the product. Oh, this is great. Where do we buy this from? And I was saying, you buy it from England. And they're saying, is that New England? No, 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 not New England. England. Oh, right. No. I'd, 
there was the appetite there to to import, which was you know it's always a bit difficult to import a product. You have to go through different uh, things. So I didn't sell any sure. shoes. However, in 1968, and by the time I actually got into America, it was 1979, 11 years. It took 11 years of uh, knocking on the door trying. But the reason we got there is that late in... Late 11 in the- years, wow. <laughs> 11 years. It's a long time, isn't it? But, you know, America's a nice place to go to. Chicago isn't, but, you know, Chicago... Well, Chicago is a nice place, but in uh, in February, that's not a nice place to be in February in Chicago. It's uh, it's full of snow and ice, and it's very cold. It's the coldest I'd ever known. So it was, it was really cold. But eleven years. But I think every every third year they used to go down to Houston, in Texas, and I, I don't know why that was, but they did every third year. It was two years in Chicago, one year in Houston. It was great going down to Houston because it's so warm. By comparison to Chicago, but uh, so it took me eleven years. But really, uh, to to get in, this is where we had a lot of luck. Running, running started to become a big category in America. A lot of people in the late sixties and all the way through the seventies, running grew, and with it, of course, Nike. Nike grew with that running boom, and also Runner's World. Runner's World is a magazine. I think he's still going to Runner's World magazine. But I remember still- Runner's World very well. <laughs> it started as a very small A4 page, but it ended up by 1975 as a magazine, color color magazine and telling you everything, where you, where you should go, the races, the results. So it was like a Bible. People used to buy it and they loved it. And uh, Bob Anderson, who published the magazine, oh, well, he he knew all about running, and he decided he could tell everybody what was the number one shoe to buy. Well, you know, 360 million Americans, 10% of them were now running, 36 million wanted to run, and about, we'll say 10% of those, 3.5, 3.6 million, would want to buy that number one shoe. And Phil Knight couldn't produce that. Mm-hmm. I mean, he was he was producing them in uh, out, out of Japan, and there was no absolutely no chance of turning up the production to that level. And of course, by the time the production was coming in, and the retailers were now they were stocking up with this number one shoe. Bob Anderson, after twelve months, decided we need another number one shoe. Well, <laughs> you can imagine these hmm. shoes are just coming in. Last year's shoes are just coming in, and now he changes to another one. So. The retail trade, all the retail sports outlets, they they were up in arms. So Bob Anderson changed the uh, changed the strategy. Instead of having a number one shoe and then you know number two and whatever, it would do a star rating. So he, the top, the best hmm. shoes would be five stars, four stars, three stars. And I knew we could make a five star shoe. It was, it was fairly difficult to try and become number one. Particularly with Nike just being down the road from uh, uh, from Runner's World, but I knew we could make a five star shoe. And in 1978, we had our Aztec. Aztec was our five star shoe. That was our offering. We tested out. Hmm. It was part of the gold range. We had a gold range in our product. Inca Inca was a spike shoe. Um, the Midas Midas was a road racing shoe. And Aztec was the training shoe. That was the one everybody would buy, Aztec. Mm. And uh, I had that in Chicago in 1979. And I got Kmart. Kmart came, and because running was growing so much, they'd heard about us. And uh, they said, we want 25,000 pairs. All right. <laughs> but for our factory, that was about six months' work. <laughs> we, we, we were only a small factory. We were obviously, uh, we were obviously punching mm-hmm. above our weight. But, but you know, we we were thought in. Sure. Uh, we were considered in the UK to be the the leader when it came to uh, athletic shoes. We we really our name had really grown. But uh, my friend Shackleton, who had left Lawrence Sports, he'd gone to Barter. Barter in those days was the biggest hmm. shoemaking company in the world, and uh, he was there. So he said, "Look, Joe, if you get orders, we'll we'll help you. We'll we'll make them for you." Right. Good. But then came out and said, "But we want a better price." Huh. And a better price meant mm-hmm. going, going to Asia. Man, we had to go. And in those days, it was South Korea. 
And so what year was this? This, what year was this? Well, we're talking now uh, 1979. 1979. Okay. Um, so, but we'd also, we'd also thought about that. I'd, and I'd made contact with the agent for a large Korean factory. They had an agent in London. So I'd make contact there. So, yes, if we did get a five-star shoe, we could get it at the right price and we could go out to Korea to make them. And <clears throat> so I thought, well, okay, came out, fine, 25,000 pairs. But, you know, they're, they're such a big big outfit. I thought, well, yeah, maybe that was my first 25,000 pairs and last 25,000 pairs because if if they didn't sell for the square footage that they were, they were going to use for, for the product, sure, they would just skip. But also Paul Feynman came along. Paul Feynman came along, and uh, he his company was Boston Camping. And Boston Camping were a smallish wholesale company with tents, fishing rods, hmm. all you need for if you're going camping and hunting and fishing. You know, but it was only a small company. He, he was running that with his brother Steve <clears throat> and uh, his, uh, his brother-in-law. There were three of them. They were doing that. And I could tell when Paul came along. He was pretty what fed up. Of doing the same, I think for ten years they'd had this business, and they were just sort of, well, we're going nowhere. We just keep on selling the same stuff year on. And he said, "Joe, I'd love to be a distributor. I'd love to take on Reebok." He said, "But we need a five star shoe." And I said, "Paul, come on, have a look at this. Aztec. This is it. No, Aztec." Yeah, he said, "Okay, Joe. I yeah. like it. I love it. But it's not a five star shoe yet, is it? No, it's not because." I think it was July when the uh, the running uh, uh, issue came out and the shoe issue came out, and we're only in we're only in February. Okay, so he said, "Look, Joe, if you get a five star shoe, I'm your man." Right. So there's a bit of time between February and and July, and the end of June, the uh, the issue, the July or the shoe issue comes out. Meantime, I've been to uh, over to Boston. Had a look at their operation. Very nice. It's a good salesman. They were, yeah, <clears throat> this would be a nice bolt on business. Fantastic. This looks like the best option because during my 11 years, I had had at least six attempts and six failures to get on the market. It was for whatever reason. Wow. There was no penetration. <clears throat> but we were trying to push. If we could get a five star shoe, it'd be different. That would be the hook. That would get us into the market because people would love to buy a five-star shoe. So that was the challenge. And uh, so we uh, – I've been over to America and had a look at the operation. In fact, Paul Feynman came over to the UK and looked at, uh, you know, well, how, you know, <clears throat> how big is Reebok? You know, what's on the market? And he wanted to see some of the races. But, you know, we, we knew where to take him. We knew the races and we knew who would win. And we had at least 50% of the runners would be running in Reebok. So that was great. So one of the things okay. that I know that you did, uh, you released the Reebok Freestyle in 1982, which was the first athletic shoe yeah. designed for women. What was the response initially on that shoe? We, we got there. We came in as a running company and we're doing nicely. And we had distribution all over USA, and we had representatives. <clears throat> and one of our tech reps, Arnold Martinez, his his wife, his wife was going to these aerobic classes and coming back and absolutely full of it. Oh, it's fantastic! And Arnold said, "Well, just a minute. What are you doing? What are what are aerobic classes? Well, it's exercise to music, and it's fantastic." So Arnold went down to the next uh, next class, and you saw the instructor in sneakers, half the class in sneakers. The other half, no shoes. He had a good light bulb moment. Though. Why Why don't we make them a shoe? Glove leather, very soft, very cushioned. And uh, <clears throat> he went out to Paul Feynman. And Paul said, look, we're a running company. You know, what do we want to do making dancing shoes? We're a running company. But Steve didn't, uh, <clears throat> he didn't work. He, he went around the back and he had a word with, uh, sorry, Arnold didn't work. He went around the back to see Steve Liggett. Steve Liggett was our production man. And he persuaded Steve to get him 200 pairs of this shoe, which he did. He gave them to the uh, girls. They loved them. <clears throat> Problem is they were made with uh, glove leather. And the glove leather, they only lasted about four or five weeks. 
But the girls, I mean, we're talking about America, we're talking about California. The girls had the money, the sport, they had loved them so much. They didn't just use them uh, in the classes, they went to work in them, they, they wore them all the time. And when they fell apart, they went out and bought another pair. So that was great. We soon answered that problem and we got more of a garment leather. So now we have aerobics. All of a sudden, it was a woman's company. Well, we were only a small running company. So when aerobics took off, and it took off because Jane Fonda, she bought a pair of our uh, freestyle and she wore them in her videos, her exercise videos, her fitness videos. So this thing just absolutely exploded in uh, in California. We were a $9 million, as a running company, we were a $9 million company. Not big, but, you know, in those days, nice. <clears throat> the year after we were... Th- we were a $30 million company. Year after that, a $90 million company, then a $300 million, then $900 million. So that was the explosion that happened. And and it was a woman's company. I love it. Well, I, I think like the key things that I've heard you talk about, Joe, and so many lessons learned in here. But first of all, don't put all your eggs in one basket because uh, right. you never know when a salesperson is... is uh, going to be leaving and somebody that you a, a distributor that you've depended on uh, might not be working out so well and constantly watching trends along the way. And then also influencers. Influencers have always been here, right? And Jane Fonda yes, yes. was the influencer then and, and definitely helped you uh, really get on the map for a lot of people. So it's incredible what what you built. And what year did you actually step down to? I stepped down in uh, 19, the end of 1989. That's when I stepped down. By that time, we, we, had, grown, we had grown so big that we were nearly a four a four billion dollar company then, and the company had become corporate. You know, we had so many lawyers, so many accountants, and a lot of people in between. Um, <clears throat> I was looking after international because I put on Paul Fireman as the uh, the American distributor, and then after that, I put another thirty distributors on around the world. So I was just traveling around the world. I was also hosting the pro celebrity tennis in Monte Carlo. And, uh, you know, we had a lot of celebrities uh, that came, uh, John Forsyth, Linda Evans, um, as John Collins, Frank Sinatra, we actually got there on one occasion, and Sean Connery, Roger Moore. There were, there were just lo- all these people were there, and great people. But it was a, it was a life I was, I was going around the world three times a year. Globally, I was just traveling three times a year. And I would, I would arrive being picked up by a limousine, yeah, go to the best hotels and eat at the best restaurants. But, you know, it was like a bit of an artificial world. It didn't feel quite right for me. And the challenge wasn't there anymore. So once the challenge had gone, I thought better to step back and retire. I absolutely loved your story. You are clearly, Joe, the true embodiment of entrepreneurship and talking. I mean, your book, The Shoemaker, as I mentioned before it's right here so so interesting and coming from you know an entrepreneur uh that i am i just i really appreciated so many of the challenges that you went through and the tenacity the creativity the ability to just figure it out and at times when things are hard think you know what can i do in order to move forward i read all of that and and felt all of that in this book. So thank you so much for coming on and sharing a little bit about your journey. And everybody needs to pick up this book, The Shoemaker by Joe Foster, the founder of Reebok. And thank you so much, Joe. Thank you, everybody, for listening. And definitely, if you like this podcast, uh, please give it five stars, subscribe, and you can also follow Joe uh, and Joe Foster. I know you're on Twitter and uh, what other social platforms are you on? Well, we're on Instagram. We're on Facebook. We're we're on on all the uh, uh, social media. We're on social media. We're on all of them. Because, you know, we have just one more objective left in life and that's gets to get the book to be a bestseller. I love it. And definitely pick up a copy of the book and hopefully everybody will get a chance to, uh, 
pick up a copy of my book as well, Undaunted, and uh, mm-hmm. two entrepreneurial books together. Uh, it'll keep your weekend interesting for sure. And uh, I hope everybody has a great rest of the week. So thank you so much, Joe. And thanks everyone for listening. Kara, it's been a pleasure.